your voice. Lift up your voice. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And rejoice in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For oh, where the presence of the Lord, there is freedom. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm gonna dance and I'm gonna worship you. Hallelujah. I'm gonna dance and praise you. It doesn't matter what comes my way. The greater one lives inside of me. 
Can we give you praise? Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Holy amaze of his goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Think about the lyrics of the song. Think of the goodness of God.
don't you just tell him that this morning thank you jesus, jesus you are all i need thank nothing you. else today god jesus you are all i need today hallelujah jesus hallelujah god you're worthy jesus oh lord we worship you today you're all i need god hallelujah 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 jesus amen you know it, it it has burdened me today to just tell this congregation the bible says that in revelation of course it says the spirit is speaking to the church it says he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church but it it conflicted me because the spirit is not speaking to the lost the church is in charge of speaking to the lost the spirit speaks to the church and the church speaks to the world so that means if the church does not speak the world will not hear and I believe we have a powerful church here who is speaking the word of God, praying, fasting, and sacrificing. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Somebody just say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning your attention to the word of the Lord, thank you for your worship and your praise, your sensitivity and your response. It's been such a pleasure being here. I'm going to read from 2 Timothy. And, and my wife, she spoke uh, Thursday. Was it Thursday? Saturday, my God, I get all the days mixed up now. It's going to get really uh, crazy when we leave 1230 tomorrow afternoon from Sydney and land in Austin, Texas at 230 in the afternoon on Monday, the same day we leave. That's going to really mess me up. <laughs> it's just a two-hour flight <laughs> that takes 30 hours to get there. <laughs> Amen. Pray for us. My wife's, of course, she's 21 weeks pregnant with a baby boy, and, and she has to put up with me. So uh, pray for her as we fly across the world and and uh but i'm going to read she she taught from this scripture the other day and and uh the woman had a good time and i think we all need to have a good time now so i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback off of her <laughs> and read from this text i do want to give honor to this church and i know we have other visiting churches here but i, I want to specifically give honor to the church the pentecostals of limbrook and and pastor hogben and and sister hogben i said it the other night i said you can't find anybody nicer than sister hogben but you can find a few people nicer than brother hogben but that was just a joke i he still hasn't paid me yet so that's just a joke <laughs> amen we so enjoy this church we feel like it's a home or a long way from home and and uh, we love their family brother daniel and sister lolly uh, hogben and and uh, i've got to give a special thank you to brother uh, and sister gabriel who has supplied their home and and supplied their food and and uh, allowed us to uh, in fact, we kicked Maddie out of her room, and I'm so sorry about that. And, and uh, but I, they taught me how to play cricket yesterday, and so, and so my back is hurting like fire now. And uh, but we had a good time, and I just had to say a special thank you to them because they were at our becking call when we were too hot. They turned the AC on when we were too cold. They turned the heater on, and and uh, we made them late to church a couple times, and they fed us, and and they've helped me look more and more like an evangelist as we've been here this week, and. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. I've grown <laughs> in the Lord <laughs> because of them. And uh, we just had such an amazing time. And uh, it's amazing because two and a half years ago, we spent three months here all over Australia. And I think just in our ministry, and uh, of course, I don't base everything that God does on our ministry. But in our ministry, in three, in three months here, two and a half years ago, we saw maybe 15 filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and now in two weeks, we've seen over 20 filled with the Holy Ghost. That's telling us something that God is on his way back. And it's easy, and I'm just kind of reiterating what I said the other night, but it's easy to get our perception on the world and think, God, what is happening the Bible says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And this world is shaking. This world is shaking because God is on his way back. And I told uh, brother and sister Gabriel, I said, people here in Australia, it's amazing. Uh, brother, brother Daniel Hogben experienced it this morning. He, before he could even get his hands laid on somebody, he was already speaking in tongues. People here in Australia, it seems, over the 20 that I've seen receive the Holy Ghost, it's like before I can even lay my hands hands on them they're already speaking in tongues there is a hunger there is a thirst there is a desire that is alive in Australia people are hungry for the Lord 
Jesus said, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Is there anybody here tonight that's hungry for revival, thirsty for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for having us. It has been our honor, and we look forward to coming back in Jesus' name. And it's good to see my friends, the Damons. I love them. And we had good re revival a couple of years ago. And, and uh, it's good to be back with them again in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy, Paul is speaking to his child, so to speak, in the gospel, his son in the faith. And he tells him, and this was Paul's last letter. And some of the women, they know where I'm going for just a second, who were there yesterday morning. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that word unfeigned means sincere or genuine. It's, it's the real stuff, you know, it's not that fake stuff. He says, when I call to remembrance your real faith, the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I am persuaded that it's in you also. That's what I feel here tonight. That when I look at you and when I've been with you in the past in this week, I know that there is unfeigned, unshakable, unmutable faith that no devil can silence. There is faith in this congregation, in this church, that nothing can silence. He says, wherefore I put you in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love of a sound mind everybody say amen. amen tonight I want to preach to you on this subject and I feel a powerful anointing in this place tonight I feel a vengeance of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight I want to preach to you tonight on this subject you cannot stop a praying church you cannot stop a praying church. Would you just pray with me for a moment Lord we love you more than words can express <laughs> I love you, Jesus. And your spirit is welcome in this service. Do as you have designed. Speak as you have orchestrated. That when we leave this place tonight, we shall all be changed and transformed by the renewing of our mind. Oh God, move and manifest your glory in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Would you just give God a hand clap of praise and a shout of victory in the place tonight? Let that go for just another moment. Uh, let that praise go for just another moment. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy. Uh, you are worthy of all the glory, uh, all the praise, uh, all the honor. Uh, holy, holy, holy uh, is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Turn to your neighbor right now and look them in the eye and say, nothing can stop you. As long as you're praying. Amen. I don't even think I gave her this verse, but I'm going to start with the verse I didn't give them. It's all right if you can't get to it. But in Habakkuk chapter 3, I love this passage of Scripture. The prophet Habakkuk prophesy, pro, pro, he prophesizes. <laughs> he says... Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and the labor of the olive shall fail. This is Habakkuk 3, 17. He says, In the field shall yield no meat, and the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet. I like to say like kangaroo's feet. <laughs> and he will make me to walk upon my high places. What I love about this prophecy is he says, although he says, assume or suppose that the fig tree does not blossom and the fruit does not come and the labor 
fails and the fields yield no meat and the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls. He says, suppose there's a setback. Suppose there's brokenness. Suppose there's famine. Suppose there's no revival. Suppose there's no waters tr uh, troubled. Suppose there's nobody receiving the Holy Ghost. Suppose there is nothing happening, although we've prayed and we've fasted. We've prayed and we've fasted. We've preached and we have taught. We've, we've knocked doors and we passed out flyers we, we've done Bible studies yet there has been no herd in the stalls the flock has been cut off from the fold but he changes it all around with the response you know that it's never the circumstance that defines you it's the response that defines you and this church is defined by our prayers. We're not just defined. We have the best preaching in the world. We have the best worship in the world. But we are defined by the powerful prayers that is locked up inside of your spirit. He says, yet I will rejoice. In other words, he said, I will not stop speaking. I will not stop praying. I will not stop worshiping. I will not stop getting on my face. In the, I won't stop going to church. I won't stop giving in my all. I don't care if I'm broken. I don't care if... I don't care if I've been set back. I don't care if I've been discouraged, depressed. I don't care if I've got doubt. I don't care what's come against me. I will pray. It was the disciples who came to Jesus in Luke chapter 11 and they asked him the question. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. They knew something about Jesus. They saw him walk on water. They saw him turn water into wine. They watched him step to the bow of the boat and say, peace be still, and the storm stopped. They watched him touch a leper who was unclean. They watched him spit in a blind guy's face and say, now go wash, and his eyes were opened. They watched him raise the dead with one word, Lazarus! If I was a disciple, I would have said, teach me how to raise the dead. Teach me how to heal the sick. Teach me how to walk on water. Teach me how to turn water into wine. <laughs> Maybe water into lemon, lime, and bitters or something that you drink in Australia. I don't know. Hopefully we don't drink too much wine around here. But he said, I would have said, teach me how to do something like that. But they knew that the power comes from the prayer. They watched him seclude himself into a mountain in the middle of the night and pray and pray and pray. He would submit himself. The Bible says in Luke 4 that the Spirit led him into the wilderness where he prayed and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted of the devil three times and and the Bible says when he came out of the wilderness, uh, he came out in the power of the Holy Ghost. There's something about prevailing prayer. They knew there was something when he prays. When he pray, There's something. When Jesus prayed for 40 days in Luke 4, he came out and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He said, I can't help it. I've been praying. I can't keep my mouth closed. I've been praying. I can't be silent. I've been praying. I've got to testify. I've got to preach. I've got a testimony. I've got to give Get this out. So they said, teach us to pray. It was Charles Spurgeon who spoke many famous words on prayer. He wrote, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. He said, groanings which cannot be uttered are often prayers which cannot be refused. He said, he that is never on his knees on earth shall never stand upon his feet in heaven. He went on and said, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. And finally, the one that shakes my bones with conviction, he said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. He said, if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. 
I don't know what that does for you, but that shakes me with conviction. He's saying, God, if there's one person in Melbourne, if there's one person in Australia, if there's one person in this world that must go to hell, don't let them step off the cliff of eternity into the lake of fire without first stepping over my body praying, without feeling my arms of intercession wrap around their knees, hearing my voice saying, no, don't go no there's a better way no there is grace no there is love there is a God who has died for you and his name is Jesus come on would you lift up your voice for just a moment in time and let all of hell hear your voice It was James who said in James 5, 16 to confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word fervent in the Greek, it means slow friction that sparks a fire. Not a match. Not a, not a lighter, not something you can just click on and click off whenever you feel like it. It's a fervent prayer, he said. It's slow friction over time that causes a fire. It's like getting two sticks. I've never had to do it, but it's like getting two sticks and rubbing them together. You gotta put that elbow grease into it. You gotta put your muscles into it. You gotta put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. And you burn, and you run, and you grind, and you rub that friction together until eventually you see just a little bit of smoke and eventually you see maybe just a little spark but you keep burning because you keep grinding because it's fervent it's fervent it's slow friction and eventually a fire begins to burn and when when fire starts it is one of the most contagious elements in our world today the most powerful one of the most powerful things in our world today is fire. Can you imagine if we had that fervent prayer? See, we know how to pray. We just don't know how to pray consistently with discipline, with fervency. He says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then it goes on, and I've, I've read this this week before, but he goes on to speak about Elijah, the man whose anointing we'd all love to have, who called fire down from heaven, who stopped the rain in the heavens. He called fire down from heaven and killed 450 prophets and ran faster than a chariot. It said Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. We think Elijah had some great anointing but beyond behind his anointing was a powerful prayer life I was praying on my face one day and I said God just like Elisha I want a double portion of Elijah's anointing and God spoke back to me and said you will never have a double portion of his anointing until you have a double portion of his prayer life you know the story of Elijah when he called fire down from heaven and he gets up and he says, Ahab, you better get you better get running, baby, because it's about to pour. He got his servant and you remember what he did? He said, go and look and see if there's any, any sign of rain. And you know the story. The servant comes back seven times and says, six times and says, I haven't seen anything. And Elijah continues to say, go again. You know why he had the faith to say go again? Because he was a man of prayer and he had been praying. See, you don't have the faith to say go again when you're not prepared and you've not prayed. But when you've prayed and you feel, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you begin to pray, some of you know what I'm talking about. You feel something inside of you that others don't feel. See, Elijah started feeling something. He didn't hear anything. He didn't see anything. He felt something in his prayer. He said, uh-oh, it's about to rain. He had been praying and he felt something in his gut. Uh-oh, I feel something a burning. I feel something a brewing. Something is about to happen. 
See, some of you are catching on. You know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been praying for the rain. You've been praying for your children. You've been praying for your marriage. You've been praying for the backsliders and you've been feeling it. I feel something. It's about to rain, baby. It's about, ah, God's about to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we cannot contain. Ha, ha, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Do you feel it? It is here. It is now. Let me just show you this. Watch. First Kings 18. It says, and Elijah said to Ahab, get thee up. Eat and drink for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Nobody else heard the sound. You know why? It wasn't a tangible sound. It was a Holy Ghost sound. It was a spiritual sound. Like some of you preachers feel, I feel something. I hear something. Something's a coming. Watch, watch, watch. I got a revelation for you tonight. Verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. That is a posture of desperation. That is a position of urgency. He got down and put his face between his knees. He said, servant, go look while I keep praying. Servant, go knock doors while I keep praying. Church, go testify. I feel something coming. And he began to groan. Oh, there's something coming. Oh, let it be now. Oh, there's revival. Oh, Oh, I won't stop praying because nothing can stop a praying man. Nothing can stop a praying church. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't just teach about it. He didn't just preach about it. And he didn't just prophesy it. He said, rain is coming. I'm going to the prayer room. I'm just going to say it like I feel it. We need every type of outreach gimmick we can get. We need to pass out bicycles. and We need to give backpacks away and school supplies when they go back to school. We need to give things away for Christmas. We need to do gimmicks like that. But the greatest outreach program this church will ever have is a prayer room full of prayer warriors. Yeah, I didn't know uh, the greatest outreach program we will ever have is an apostolic church full of intercessors. You know why? Because where you can't go, the Spirit can. Where you can't reach, the intercession can reach. Ha! Huh? I'll just go ahead and stop for a second and I'll give you point blank a testimony. Right now, I'll give you an example. Just a few years ago, I was preaching in Houston, Texas. Some of you there were this morning, same same church that I prayed for that man in the hospice. And I was preaching there, and, and I preached there several years ago, and I'm preaching to a youth group of about 10 to 12 kids, just, just the youth group, preaching to them. And God speaks to me and says, I'm sending a revival to this church that these walls cannot contain, and I'm doing it through them. I'm looking at a bunch of kids. One of them was just disowned by his family because he got baptized in Jesus. In Jesus' name. The other's been molested by her father. Another one's addicted to pornography. Another one's addicted to marijuana. I'm looking at a bunch of broken down youth group members. I'm thinking, what? You're going to use them to send revival? It's like God said, haven't you read my word? I said, I chose the foolish to confound the wise. I chose the weak. I chose the despised. I chose the broken. I said, okay, God, here it goes. God is sending revival to this church that these walls can't contain and he's chosen you to be the vessel for revival. They just sat there staring at me like you just did right there. Musicians. <laughs> so, 
about six or seven weeks later, I love getting the phone call. I got a, I got a text message from Pastor Berendorf today. I love getting those phone calls and text messages from pastors after I leave because I, 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 revival's not here because of me, baby. Revival is here because you're sacrificing. God sees your sacrifice. When I'm gone, revival is just getting started. Pastor Berendorf texted me today and said, hey, man, we had more people get filled with the Holy Ghost today, this morning in, in church. Revival's get, just getting started. So this pastor from the church, he calls me and says, man, you won't believe it. That's the other thing I love hearing. You won't believe it. I say, try me. I prophesied it. I might believe it. You won't believe what's happened. I said, well, what's going on? He said, our youth group. He said, one of the guys in the youth group, the guy who was disowned by his parents, he said he went to his youth pastor and said, hey, if God's sending us revival, then we need to get ready. We need to pray. He said, you know how we have 30 minutes of prayer before church? He said, yeah, what about it? He said, let's go to the prayer room one hour, one hour before church to pray. You know, it's funny to me because, you know, we talk about revival and miracle signs and wonders. And then we look for this, some sort of rocket science formula that's so complicated. Only one guy with an IQ of 520 could read it. Jesus gave us the secret formula in 2 Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The formula is not complicated. The formula is not a secret. God said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. For everyone that asketh will find. For everyone that seeks will find. For everyone that knocks it shall be opened unto them. There's no secret complicated formula. This youth group, they went to the prayer room one hour before church pastor said this is six eight weeks later he said chris i walked into the prayer room 30 minutes before church i found 12 kids drunk slain in the spirit speaking and groaning in the holy ghost he said sunday school hour they start sunday school at 11 sunday school hour came around and the sunday school teacher said pastor what do we do this is our sunday school he said scratch the program this is better than sunday school that's some of my problem we, we can't scat, scratch the program that's my problem. I can't shut up sometimes when God's saying, get out of the way. I'm ready to, I'm ready to move. Anyways, just a little confession. It's good for the soul. He said, I found 12 kids slain in the Holy Ghost. He said, forget it. Forget the program. Leave them there. Another hour goes by. Hour number two. They said, Pastor, it's time for church. This is our, our drummer here and our worship leader or our praise singer here. What do we do? He said, forget the program. This is revival. He said, let's get a few men who will carry them into the sanctuary. They carried these kids into the sanctuary, laid them at the foot of the altar. He said, for four straight hours, the entire church of about 110 people went to their face and and got drunk in the Holy Ghost. He said, we had an old-fashioned prayer revival. I said, wow, praise God. He said, no, that's not even the good part. I said, what's the good part? He said, it's only been seven or eight weeks. He said, just last Sunday, we had nearly 300 people in our congregation. He said, we couldn't fit them. He said, we were sitting people up in the aisles. He said, you know why? He said, because what happened that Sunday has happened every Sunday since you left. He said, I've not preached. We've not had any music. The kids have gone in the prayer room, got a hold of God, and we carry them out and have an old-fashioned prayer revival every Sunday. He said, he said, we're having first-time visitors we've never seen or talked to before. He said, so I asked one of the visitors, I said, what brought you to our church today? He said, well, pastor, I was driving to the grocery store just a couple days ago, and when I passed your church, he said, I felt something reach out to me. It was like fire that grabbed a hold of me. I knew I needed to revisit this church. Don't act like you don't believe it. He said, on top of that, we've had backsliders, former ministers who are on our platform who are backslidden. He said, ministers, children who weren't living for God anymore. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, we've had backsliders who have lost their way with God show back up at our church. 
He said, so I went to one of them. Listen, he said, I went to one of them and I said, what brought you back to church? It's been six months. It's been seven years. What brought you back to church? And one of the men said, well, pastor, it's the funniest thing because for the last six weeks, I've not been able to get one night of sleep. Every night I lay down in bed and my mind is tormented. I just can't sleep. I feel like I'm being attacked by something. He said, so finally I got on my face and I began to pray. I've not prayed in years, but I began to pray. And I said, devil, get thee behind me. He said, and God spoke back and said, it's not the devil. It's a praying church. Get back to church. Get back to church. Get back to church. Get back to church. Oh, I'm here to tell somebody there is victory in your voice. There is power in your voice. You cannot stop a praying church. You can't. You can't shut up a praying church. You can't slow down the revival of a praying church. Lift up your voice unto the Lord. Lift up your voice unto the Lord. Come on, lift them up. Lift them up. Lift them up. Lift them up. there's something here there's something here there's something here there is something happening there is power in your voice there is victory in your voice oh there is salvation in your voice That's okay. Just lift up your voice for another moment. I feel the Holy Ghost moving. I feel the Holy Ghost reaching. Yeah! Listen to me. Those who are standing, you can remain standing. I, I just want to tell you this. You can do what you feel. I just want to tell you this right now. Uh, there is something divinely powerful about the voice that God has put into you. I feel a prophetic anointing. I feel that the thing that you are waiting to see from God is locked up in your voice. Ha. My mentor, some of you know, Brother Stone King, he has told me this. He's taught this, and I've never spoken it publicly, but I'll use what he says. He says how there is so much power in our voices, we don't realize it. He said, God used the people of Israel to march around the Jericho the nation and just shout with their voice. They didn't have to be super anointed. They didn't have to be preachers. They didn't have to be musicians. They shouted with their voice, and walls came down. You find in your Bible where people... People shouted and armies became discomfited. Armies became divided and began fighting against themselves. You know what Brother Stone King always says? He says what, what he studied is that when someone shouts, they've done a study and they found that when your voice shouts, it literally shreds the air. And the Bible says that the devil is the prince and the power of the air. When you shout, when you shout, when you... When you shout, you shred the devil's kingdom down. Let there be a shout. Let there be a shout. Ha! Yay, your soul. I want everybody to stand to your feet. I don't need to go any further. 
Listen to me. Listen, I'm done preaching, but this is what God has instructed me to tell you. How many of you remember the story of Paul and Silas in Acts 16? And at midnight, watch, they were in chains. God, there's a prophetic anointing here. They were in chains. The church, some of you here tonight, you still come to church, but you know there's chains around you. You might be standing, but you're not marching. You might be coming, but you're not able to lift your hands because there's chains. You might be coming, but you're not shouting because there's chains. Listen, at midnight, they had been locked in the inner prison. It says, but at midnight, watch, they began to pray. And you know what it says? You might not know this. It says, and the prisoners were listening to them. Did you know it said that? It says, and the prisoners were listening to them I feel in this prophetic anointing to tell somebody what you don't realize is the people, the prisoners around us <laughs> they don't even know it they don't even realize it but their soul is longing to hear your prayers they are listening to this service right now and watch when they prayed there was an earthquake it says the foundation shook and watch it says the chains were broken off of everybody in the prison I said there is deliverance in your voice there is victory Listen, listen, if you're not here and you don't need salvation, you ought to lift up your voice for somebody in your family who needs it because the spirit world is listening. They are listening. They are listening. Can you imagine what would happen if we lifted up our voice in one accord? <laughs> 